This is the beginning week of a two-week class called an Introduction to the Venetian Style. And we've been working on relatively straightforward processes, basic things like making vessels and tumblers and blown feet and that sort of thing. And next week we'll do some cane work. And the, the, the pinnacle of all cane working activity is reticello, that technique that was particularly popular in the late 17th, early 18th century in Venice. It's a complicated project process, takes a long time. And you have two sets of canes that are superimposed, one clockwise, one counterclockwise. I'm going to do something slightly different in addition to this. I'm going to thinly line the inner part with clear glass. And that's a process called sbrufo. Funny word, S-U-B-R-U-F-F-O. It's got too many consonants. Sbrufo. And what it is, is a business of lowering into a roll-up essentially a blown foot. You lower the blown foot bubble in and you blow really hard. And if you do it right, you, li you line the roll-up and you don't trap air bubbles. So we're going to show that, and that'll be different from, uh, from the normal process. The advantage is that in a plate or a platter, you wind up with a thin coating of clear glass on the upper surface. So the cup is already in the pickup box, sitting there re ready for us. There's the roll-up ready to go. And we're now going to do the roll-up, do the sbrufo, and do the reticello. Now there's another thing that's different about this webcast. We do this every week, like I said. It's a huge amount of work for a lot of people, and we thought we'd give you a window, a view into how this is done. So at a certain point, we're going to run a little video that we made early this morning called Getting Ready. And the process starts at 6.30 in the morning, and it ends around 8.15, 8.30, before you folks get in the building. So the webcasts have no impact on the classes, and we thought you might enjoy seeing how that happens. We're also going to have a look into the control room because we have four cameras, two remote cameras that are robotically controlled, a camera back here with Lou, Dan is on a handheld, and somebody about 400 feet away is mixing all that stuff, and we're going to give you a view into the control room. But first, First, the roll-up. So, I'm going to put a Pastorelli up. Dan, you could, I mean, uh, Ben, you could go ahead and get that. This, you're ready, I'm ready whenever you are. This is called the Pastorelli. A lot of people think that the plate is the Pastorelli. Understand that this is the Pastorelli and that originally this had a crook on the end and it looked like a pastor's, or a, a, sorry, a shepherd's crook, or a pastor's crook. Thanks. And I could use another pair of pincers when you get a chance. Here are the canes. One has cracked, so I'm going to remove that. These have been preheated to Fahrenheit about 950. That's going to make the fusing process a lot faster. I'm going to get this a little bit hotter and then make a collar. Dan, I'm going to ask you to tell me when the little segment is ready, okay? Now that took the chill off it. I'll make the collar now.
Now, uncharacteristically of what you see in Venice, I work solo. And Reticello is very manageable solo if you have a pickup box with access from above. Making the collar a little bigger diameter. It's a little on the small side, so I'm going to compensate for that. Can't make it really any bigger. I'm going to compensate for this by, when I do the fusing, I'm going to squeeze that together a little to make it match this diameter better. <clears throat> I'll put the collar on hold. The canes go back in. I warm the post a little bit. At the mouth of this furnace, it's essentially a garage. So anything in the immediate vicinity of the mouth is pretty hot. have begun to glow slightly yellow. The edges are beginning to fire polish. I'm going to squeeze a little bit. Every furnace is, or glory hole is slightly hotter at the back compared to the front. So I'm going to turn this around. There go. The collar is probably fine. In fact, it's slightly glowing, so that, that makes it clear that it's fine. I'll just give it a sort of a token flash in the furnace. There we go. Each reheat is briefer than the one before. I'll take off the Quaretti. Years ago, I asked Johnny Toso, the great Venetian maestro who's best known for flame working, what the word Quaretti meant. And he said, uh, it means little rectangular thing. I'm going to do a final check here for <clears throat> compressing this, getting them stuck together. There's nothing worse than having gaps, especially when people are watching. Now I'll put the collar inside the furnace to get it hot. In this case, the collar is going to be pretty hot. The canes are going to be real hot, and they'll stick together, no problem. Ben, I'll ask you to take that away, please. Bring the tips together just to stabilize it. 
and I have a gap I need to close up. But before I close the gap fully, I'm going to wipe off the kiln wash that has stuck to the canes. This is a wet whisk broom. I use this amazing, amazingly excellent bullseye kiln wash, and it barely sticks to the glass, but you have to wipe it off. A little bit always sticks. Now my goal is to close the gap. Hey, Harry. Harry, just come here for a second. Would you, make, would you make it clear to them that I'm waiting for a cue that the video, the 10 minute segment is ready? Make it clear to you? Yeah. The gap is pretty much closed now. Now I'm going to marver this, reheat, marver, reheat to get it perfectly symmetrical. And then I'll do this brufo lining. Okay, so this is about ready for the Zbrufo. There's a little bit of a dent in here that I want to get rid of. Ready? Ready? So the next thing is the Zbrufo, but we're going to take a break for a couple of minutes and watch a little segment on what went on here between 6.30 a.m and about 8.30 or so. See you in a minute. August 13th, 2014. It's about seven in the morning and we have a bunch of cameras on me. We're doing this behind the scenes, how we do the webcast. It involves a lot of people. There's Brad so, on the um, camera you're yeah. looking through. There's Ryan over here. There's Rick. There's Zach, and we're about to have a whole army of other people come in. Well, here we are for another webcast, just another routine webcast. So this is an incredible amount of equipment. So the goal is to, within about 45 minutes, get this all set up and have it in place, out of the way of the students when they come in, about 8.15, 8.30. So we're about to see a small army set up a, um, a battlefield. So let's go see what Chad's doing. He's in charge of the fiber, and it's the fiber that gets it to the folks watching. So is this fiber cable? It is. That is the most bizarre connector for a little skinny cable I've ever seen. It that's, is. That's a fiber connector? It is. So let's let me see. show you. So it's a military grade connector. It's yeah. 12 fibers. Huh. And if we were to spin around and look at this rack behind us over here, yeah, carefully, yeah, 
This fiber connects to each one of these cards. I see. So each card has a job. One might be a camera, one might be an intercom system, yeah. one might be microphones going down to the studio. Uh -huh. But the studio is so far away in this building that this is the best way to get all that information there. I see. Through fiber. So Through fiber. No loss or no distortion right. or whatever glass. wire would do. Glass. <laughs> glass. Better living through glass. Yes, sir. Okay. So, Jason, these are these robot cameras that kind of fascinate me. Will you, can you yes. talk while you're doing that? Yep. These are uh, Sony pan, tilt, and zoom cameras. Yeah. They, uh, we have, so we have control of the pan, the tilt, and the zoom, so we can uh, remotely control these to keep, keep up with the action. Who's going to do that? So that'll be me as well. Uh, oh, really? I, on this production, I serve as technical director, so I, see. I sort of help get everything set up. And then during the show, I am uh, mixing the cameras, mixing the live cameras, as well as uh, controlling these two PTZs. So, that we so we're going to see use. you in the control room eventually, because we're going to have a look into the control room. Yep. Too terrific, terrific. Well, right over here, Bill, I'm setting up Two of the room mics. I see. This is an AKG C3000. Uh huh. Uh, really high quality microphone. I see. It looks like it's bouncing around in there. What's, right. What's it's the deal? suspended in here, uh -huh. and you can see it's like on little rubber bands I in see. here. Yeah, yeah. And that's to absorb any shock sound. So this, when it's, you can notice it just wobbles. I see. Yeah, yeah. And it's not going to pick up any, you know, vibrations through the floor. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. And we set up two of these in the room, one on each side. So if there's any questions from the right. audience, right. that will be picked up. Terrific. Lou, what are you up to? Hi. These are, this is a, a sort of a handheld camera, but you're putting it on a tripod. How come? Well, so we run obviously two um, remote control cameras, and then we sometimes have two, sometimes we only have one uh, handheld camera. Okay. Um, That's actually handheld. You mean actually not in a tripod that somebody yeah, actually yes, held. Yes, okay. yeah. Now this is, obviously we can take it out, but since today we're over here, um, we're gonna use it on a tripod right back here so we can kind of get some uh, shots of you. Terrific, terrific. When you're from a different angle that we don't normally get because normally we can't stand next to a furnace. So you're gonna be back there? Are you gonna mm -hmm. be back there? That is one of my favorite shots because when there's somebody back there, you get the action at the bench. I think from better than any other place. Mm -hmm. So that'll be a really neat place. It, it will be a little warm. Yeah, it's, it's surprisingly not bad back there Good, though. good. Surprisingly. Wonderful. Well, let's see, it's 7.32. The crew's been here for about half an hour. They've got uh, a couple of microphones set up. They're stringing cable everywhere. They've got two cameras to go. Cable everywhere, there's the remote control camera up there. Let's go see what Chad's doing in regard to the fiber setup. What's going on here? Can we just... Yeah, yeah. so as I was showing you before, this is the other end of the fiber oh. optic snake. Yep. You know, it's okay. got the military grade connector. Right. 12 strands of fiber. Uh-huh. And I'm not sure if you can see up in here or not. Let's see. Let's see. But this is the hold rack on, that we're on. going oh, look to. look at that. Look at that. All right, so yeah. we've got another connector of the same sort uh -huh. right here and okay. these guys made together okay and then it goes out through this fiber patch bay out to our studio down the hall to your control room that's right okay we go in here Ooh, wow and the same series of cards that I showed you earlier yeah are here uh-huh this is kind of the central hub for all of our fiber operations we have different areas that come in from the auditorium the innovation center this is our portable rack, so the okay. rack that we have down in your oh, shop right now, this is the card system that it's talking to. I see. And then okay. from there, it goes up into these video switchers, servers, yeah, and uh, out to the world. The server is the thing that, that puts it on the web, is that true? This is the thing that actually does the mixing. Okay. Gotcha. We have a computer in next to where Jason will be doing the mixing that actually gets it to the web. Oh, interesting. Okay. Well, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Okay. So I see the robot cameras set up. I see microphones set up, and it's 10 to 8, and it seems like it's almost all done. Is it all done? It's incredible. Yeah. So, so what have you got? What is that? Uh, Bill, this is our ClearCom unit. Yeah. With this unit, we can talk with the other techs. Yes. So, like Jason is right down at the controls. Yeah. And for a particular shot. Is he actually there now? Uh, he's not there yet. I okay, don't hear whatever. him yet. Okay, yeah. Uh, but. He can tell me to pan oh, to the left or the right, to uh -huh. zoom in on a certain shot. I see. 
and then we get exactly the shot we're looking for. Okay, Bill, we're going to start with the room microphones, testing them. Okay. So I'm just going to, I'm going to walk over here to this mic. I'm just going to tap it. Yep, I got it. And Jason just let me know that he could hear that mic fine. You heard that over the intercom. Exactly, right. Okay. right. So I'm going to go over to the left microphone as well and give that a quick test. And we're good on that one. Okay. Any, and now, any, any chance of, oh, you're going to mine now, yes. right? Okay. You can go ahead and say hi to Jason. So Jason, uh, how's it going in there in the control room? Is he hearing me okay? He said it's going great. He can hear you okay. very clearly. Great. Now I am done. Jason, I got a favor. We've got these uh, remote control robot cameras. I'm dying to see them move. When is the time to check them? He's going to do it right now. Cool. Okay. So he's actually doing the one behind us. Okay, let's see. So there are two, two robot cameras. Okay, if you just turn that one in the back again what for is, us. Does the red light simply mean it's on, or is that the one he's actually using right now? It's a tally light that lets us know that which one he's controlling. Okay, I see. So that means he's controlling that one right now. I see, cool. Ryan, it's three minutes till eight. What's the status of the setup? The I think the setup's just about complete. Okay. Which brings us to the end of our behind the scenes video. Wonderful. I think we're pretty much there. This has been great. Yeah. It's been really, really great to see the whole behind the scenes. It's just before eight. Jeremy Unterman, our technician on duty today, is lighting the glory hole so that at nine o'clock, the students will come in the glory holes will be lit. And so now it's time to go back live to the webcast. Yep, come back to the class. Okay, so I'll turn it back to you, Bill. Thanks, Bill. That was great. That was really interesting. We're gonna get back to the Reticello with the Sbrufo now. So we've got the roll up done, I'm going to basically make a, a kind of a big blown foot and lower that into the roll-up. I don't want too much glass here, but I'm going to do a, I just did a preliminary coating gather. very much like a blown foot. Of course, that closes the hole in the pipe. So I'm going to attach the blow hose and begin blowing during this reheat. And that'll pretty quickly clear the hole. <clears throat> now it's time to close the end.
you just heard that, that was the liner popping through. So the pipe is now open. I'll complete the closing of the liner. You always get one of these little flowers. I think I said this before, but I've been saving these since 1983. Someday I'm going to think of something brilliant to do with them. There we go. It hasn't occurred to me yet, but I'm waiting. Um, yeah. I give it two minutes, two minutes, one minute, 30 seconds. The question is when to turn up the pickup box that has the cup in it. If it has to be at about 1,000 Fahrenheit or it will crack when I put the insert in. 1,000 Fahrenheit will slump this glass within about five minutes. So if you turn it up too early, you wind up with a destroyed cup. If you do it too late, the cup cracks. So I'd say about now. I'm going to begin the twist on the marver. The insert, this part, has to be twisted the opposite direction of the cup. It is my convention to always twist the cup pulling and the insert pushing. What I mean by that is I'll hold the end and twist away from me for the insert. twist on the marver so that the torque is distributed all the way up and down. Ben, what's the temperature? Good. Dip the tip once more with the hope of making the twist a little tighter before I put the two together. Looks pretty good. And I'm just about ready to go in and insert the in part, inner part into the cup. Ben, read out. Okay, here we go. You have to blow very hard to trap the bubbles nicely. So you see at the intersection of every four canes there was a void. Those are now bubbles.
Now from here on, it's pretty straightforward glass blowing. So for the next few minutes, maybe the next five minutes, we're gonna show you the view of what's going on in the control room. You'll still be able to see me blowing glass, but you'll see how Jason in the control room picks the shots. So we'll do that for a few minutes. control room and as you can see on my view if you look up I'm looking at all the cameras we have down in the studio and watching the, the glass blowing and trying to just keep up with Bill so he's on the Marver now so I'll pick the Marver shot and if we go back to Dan Dan is handheld and he's showing the process so you're trying to get a wide shot and then close up some we can um, and then we have Lou, who's actually behind the, right next to the furnace, and she is getting our close-up right now, close-up of the uh, gla glass. So we can see details, including the intersection of the cane and things like that. So here from the control room is where I uh, pick what shot we are, we're using. I also have control of the audio over here, so we turn, turn up the volume when we need to, so we can hear everybody in the studio. And we just try to keep up with the process. And, you know, we talk with the glass blower beforehand to try to understand what um, will be done so we know how to keep up. And now I'm just going to uh, continue to mix here and show you how that process is done. As well as uh, mixing, we're also uh, putting graphics on screen, which we have developed beforehand. And what's nice about the system we use here is we can uh, trigger those graphics um, uh, automatically with a macro. So with this button here, I am turning the graphics on and off. I need to cut or trim the tail where the reticello is still beautiful. It's a little, always a little messy at the bottom. So I need to cut it in at the very most south possible spot, at the very most south spot possible where the reticello looks great because this is what people are going to see when they hold the plate. The first thing they look at is the place where all the canes come together. Now, I'm gonna get this hot, blow it up a little bigger, finish the neck, trim the tail, make it a little bit rounder, and then transfer to the punty. I rub the bottom with my jack with the jacks to chill the bottom area. I'm going to get rid of this. Maybe we'll maybe we'll save that bin. You could throw that in the annealing oven, if you would, please. Thanks. I'll finish. I'll finish the neck now. Of course, this doesn't. All this work doesn't do me any good if I can't get it off the blowpipe. So the neck needs to be a little smaller diameter. Cane working is very subject. Cane 
objects are very subject to thermal stress. It's really easy to crack them. So you have to be sure and keep all the parts way above a thousand. If you let them cool down, they're very likely to crack. I think my neck is good. I need to straighten up the bubble a little bit, make it a little bit more oblate. I'll flatten the bottom prior to putting the punty on. I'm just getting the bottom edge a little sharper. Now I'll cool the punty site. I'll do that twice because I need to flash to make sure that the shoulder is well above a thousand when I transfer. You actually have to transfer it with it slightly soft. Otherwise, at the first reheat, it's very easy for the shoulder to crack. And now the transfer to the punty. If it's soft, it's a good idea to keep it moving. That way it won't deflect so easily. Stop it. Pincers in the crevice and a tap and it breaks very nicely. That's because I made a good neck and shoulder. Plates like this generally have an outer fold so that the little ridge associated with the fold is on the lower side. So an outer fold is a lot more trouble than an inner fold, but on a plate it makes a lot of sense. So here comes an outer fold, but first I'm going to use the Sofietta to true up the bubble.
going to stiffen up the punty, reheat the shoulder and sofietta. The Sofietta, the second greatest invention in the history of blast blowing. Anybody want to guess what the first one is? The blowpipe, exactly. Sofietta probably is medieval in origin. My guess is 13th, 14th century Northern Europe. Uh, sorry, Venice, not Northern Europe. Probably Venice. Probably migrated up to Northern Europe shortly thereafter. Anyway, the Sofietta allows you to shape the glass with air after you've transferred to the punty. And that is a big, big deal. There are a lot of cultures, glass working cultures, that don't have the Sofietta. And they're really at, the, at a great disadvantage. Now the outer fold. I make an acute flare, make a constriction, and then fold the edge upward. Then I pinch it to close it. Now I'm not sure that it's closed. It's essential to double check and make sure it's closed all the way around. If it opens up during the spinning out of the plate, it completely wrecks the object. So I open it a little bit this way, squeeze it there. It wasn't closed at all. I never trust it to be closed until I do this a couple of times. It's nice to have a small, very discreet little fold at the edge. It makes a little bit of quadruple reticello. Sounds like something in the Olympics, a quadruple reticello. So that I don't dare bump the door, I'm going to remove the day door, make the hole a lot bigger. This gives me a, a lot more comfort as far as the spacing goes. One of the things in glass blowing is having the discipline to stop and the discipline to carry on. This is a beautiful bowl, but I said I'd make a plate, so here goes. Now I'm going to finish this just with centripetal force. Centrifugal, centripetal. If you have two physicists in the room, they'll spend the entire week of a class talking about 
which one it really is. Anyway, you spin it to open it. Nobody can argue with that. God, it's such a pretty bow, I hate to do it. Hands for stopping. Okay, the, the platter people win. So here goes. Centripetal force, centrifugal force, whatever it is, it's fantastic. Give it a final tuning of the shape, and there we go. You see the bubbles are elongated, they're not round. I prefer bubbles that are rectangular or, or trapezoidal. A lot of people prefer round bubbles, and you get those by reheating a lot after you stick the two parts together. Years. Thank you. Thanks. Years ago, it was 1982, I made a visit to Murano, and miraculously, the great, the great maestro Caramea, Carlo Tosi, let me watch him for four days. A lot of people have never seen him work. He's very secretive. And after a day or so, he took me up to his showroom, and he had hundreds of goblets and all this, and there were like four or five pieces of reticello. And I said I'd studied Italian. I'll tell you what I learned. I'll tell you the phrase that I learned that probably caused him to let me watch him. I learned this like a parrot. Molte persone hanno parlato a me il suo lavoro meraviglioso. Many people have told me about your marvelous work. And he walked off and he brought a chair and he put it right there where Spencer is. And he said, see a comedy, have a seat and I watched him for four days. Anyway, we're up in the showroom, like four or five pieces of reticello, and I said, maestro, perché non più reticello? Maestro, why not more reticello? And he went, troppo lavoro, <laughs> too much work. <laughs> so you've seen it. Reticello is a huge amount of work. Any questions about that, about the reticello process? You had a question, Spencer. Uh, this sbrufo, right, on a bubble. It's very different. Why not roll it up on a bubble as opposed to sbrufo? To roll it up on a bubble, the liner would wind up being quite thick. Even if you made it as thin as you could, if you were Nancy Callan and you were the best person in the world at rolling up canes on bubbles, it would be a lot thicker than this. So this is a way of producing a very thin liner. Now, I've never seen it, but you could also do a colored glass liner, which, would, which is very beautiful. But in any case, it gives you a thin liner. It also automatically precludes bubbles forming. You know, the inside of the cup is very grooved. It's like this. The bubble goes in. Why don't these become bubbles, blisters? It's because I blow really hard, and as it moves downward, it occludes the air downward or upward and or upward and it's a great way to line it without trapping bubbles. It's also, rolling up on a collar is relatively easy. Rolling up on a bubble is very, very much harder. So, okay? Any other questions about the reticello? Well, there, there are three ways to twist. One is to dip the tip in water, grab it, twist. That's one way. Another way is to twist on the marver, both at an angle and the side, sideways. And that exerts the torque, it exerts the friction on more of the thing, gives the torque a better chance of being even, so you get an even twist. The other way is to have a huge optic mold, a huge dip mold on the floor, to lower it in and turn. And that too, like marvering, exerts the friction all over the thing, and you tend to get a real even twist. Oh, yeah, you twist when the thing is closed, yeah, yeah. And if you want to see the cup, the webcast was about three weeks ago, no, it was about five weeks ago, I think in June or early July, and I showed the making of that very cup, okay? 
Any other Reticello questions? All right. Let me ask Harry Seaman is our studio manager. He's been sitting over here the whole time with a laptop. And do we have any questions from the web? Okay, all right. So the first question, these little flowers that I've been producing since 1983, do I store them in any, in any specific way? In fact, I have a vat of old brandy upstairs in my office, and they go into this brandy where they're aged and eventually, no, no, they're just in a box sitting someplace. Is that the question? Yeah, I just, uh, and one of these days, I'll think of something to do with them. Okay, the other question was lamp working. There, I started lamp working in 1962. I was 11 years old. And I love lamp working. I adore lamp working. I bet I never do it anymore. And there are people who are fantastically skilled at it now. I would never dream of making a lamp working video now. So that's the answer to that. Now, in next year, in 15 or early 16, the museum is going to publish its first ebook. It's going to be by me, titled, The Techniques of Renaissance Venetian Glass, parentheses, their differences from later practice. Renaissance Venetian glass blowers did things quite differently than in the 19th century and the 20th century, and that's one of my specialties, the, the determining of one from the other. Anyway, there are a lot of videos in this. We, in fact, are going to show 25 complete objects from the museum's collection, and Three of those have flamework decoration, so in those videos I will show flameworking. Because in the late 17th, early 18th century, in Venice they were combining the two, flameworking with furnace working. Any others? Okay, we have about, we just have a little bit of time left. Do y'all have any questions? As I said, we're at the, we're at the midpoint of a two-week introduction to Venetian techniques Harry, would you grab one of those footed vessels off the shelf, off the top shelf, top, top. We've been working on tumblers and we've been working on marises, those discs that join the parts of a goblet, blown feet. And yesterday we started putting them all together. So this is where we are in the class. This morning, it is Wednesday, we added lip wraps. We've been doing folded edges. People are making nice punties. So this is where we are in the class. Next week, we'll get to some cane work. And what was the question? Sorry? Right now? Yeah, there is. Anyway, I've forgotten why I said that. But uh, yeah, does anybody have any idea? Anyway, this is where we are in the class. In a two-week class, we can get to cane work, which is really exciting. Can't do that in a one-week class. So Roman bottle, this will take under three minutes. Would somebody get out a timer, please? And uh, I'll begin. And Lisa, I'll ask you to start now, please. The Roman period bottle, the long neck bottle, is the very best thing you can do for a first demo piece. If Lino's in the audience and you do it well, he will be really impressed. Lino's a great Venetian maestro. It gets everybody's attention. It's an entire object in less than three minutes. It gives people an overview of glass blowing that gets lost when you're doing something that takes eight or nine or 10 or 12 minutes. I've blown the bubble, I've, mar I've left the tip thick, I've marbled the tip. I'm reheating, marble the tip, very important to keep the tip thick. I blow the bubble bigger and elongate that to become a tubular neck. Now the tube is thin, it cools quickly. The thick glass at the bottom is obviously still soft. I blow a second time, the bottom blows up. I stopped 
leaving thick glass on the bottom. I make a neck. Because the bottom is as thick as it is, it's still soft. You can flatten the bottom without reheating. In fact, this is still soft. I'm going to stiffen it up with a brief blow. I'll just make sure it knows where I want it to break. The transfer to the punty. Tips in the crevice, tips in the crevice, little tap, and it breaks off easily, almost easily. Reheat the opening. Roman bottles typically have a folded edge, but a typically an inner fold, which is much easier. So I'll show you that. I make it easy by just using the tip of the Sofietta. That's the beginning of the fold. And there it is. I'm going to break it off onto here. I won't bother to anneal this. And there's a Broman bottle. And Lisa, what time do we have? Oh, three minutes and four seconds. Well, on the next webcast, I'll try to do it in under three minutes. But it's a fantastic demo. Gets people on the hook really quickly. And I urge you to consider that as a, as a first demo piece. So that's it. We've got to stop. I want to thank Scott Ignashevsky and his, he's the head of the AV team here, and uh, Ryan Denisoff, who works closely with him, everybody else for this behind the scenes view of how we make webcasts. Next week, today is the 13th of July, 2014. Next Wednesday, Martin Yanetsky, the great Czech sculptor, will be demonstrating at 11 o'clock. So thanks very much for watching, and that's it. Thanks very much.